It is 7.01, and I'll go ahead and call this meeting to order. Clerk, could we have a roll call? Councilor Long? Here. Councilor Combs? Here. Councilor Hires? Absent. Councilor Ratliff? Present. We have a warrant. Okay, we'll begin with public comments. Comments will be accepted from the general public concerning topics that are not included in the meeting's agenda. Right. Individuals be limited to three minutes speaking time. Cumulative totals of all comments from the public will not exceed 15 minutes. Preference be given to telecall residents and in compliance with the Oklahoma Open Meeting Act. No action or discussion is permitted by the City Council on any issue or topic raised by speaker during this public comment period. And if you wouldn't mind, begin with your name. So we have My that name person. is Tom Barlow. And um, I actually have two topics. I'll see if I can get through both of them real quickly. But the one that's pertinent is uh, my wife and I just came back from a three-week driving tour to our hometown of Carmel, California. We passed through New Mexico and all the pretty places in Arizona and went down to Tucson, through Big Bear and Lake Arrowhead, and through Ojai and Ventura and the Carmel. And you're going to know where I'm going in just a second. Where's Nate at? Anyway, I know where I'm going in a few seconds here, but I want to get on record for when the next time somebody has to make a decision, consumer behavior and people's minds and our thoughts and our visitors could be, you know, taken into consideration. I passed through little cities that were the most beautiful little cities that had police cars that were pink and blue and white. The most beautiful little things you'd ever seen and people dressed in white and green shirts and it was really amazing. Then when I, I never thought about it. And then when I came back to Tahlequah, the first thing that happened to me, I was being followed by this black Darth Vader vehicle about ten, four feet off my bumper because he wanted to go around me because I was going 25 and a 25. And I just want to know why in the world, and not to get racial in this, is there anybody who's African American here, not to get racial involved, but even in net, the net world, white hats and black hats are considered the black hats are the bad hackers and the white hats are the good hackers. And even the government hired white hat, well, hires white hat hackers. Why in the world do we want to have an image of our city that is black on black? Why do we want to look like those little Darth Vader vehicles buzzing around the town? I mean, you should see these little, they had pink, yellow cars and blue cars. And when I was a child, they were always white with gold, protect and serve on them. And we all knew we had undercover cop cars around, and nobody knew who they were until their lights went on, but that was okay. That was what they were there for. But why do we have to present such a negative, dark, dark image of our city that people see? It's, it's just, I want to just say that so the next time it comes up, it can't be solved overnight. You might not want to solve it at all. But I'm telling you, it struck me like a bolt of lightning. I've never seen anything like it. That was the first one. Thank you. Can I go to the second one? I take care of a, a grandchild every day so her a mother and father can go to school and work both. And I go down to the water sprinkler thing. I know the Cherokee Nation and the city combined made the little water park, uh, what do they call it? Splash, splash pad. Splash pad, yeah, splash pad. And I did nothing but sit and watch my little grandbaby and other kids slip and slide everywhere and hurt themselves bad. And if we have to get a, a neighborhood group together to fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers and mothers to put together the paint and the sand it takes to make it look like Holberts or Wagners and everyone, other, everyone else I've ever seen. It's got to be done. Some kid's going to get hurt and the city's going to be liable probably, or the Cherokee Nation or one of the two. So, uh, but it, it's the children I'm thinking about. So I came here not to complain tonight, but just to encourage that there's a couple of little things that are just little things. It don't take a, well, one will take a long time and a big thing because it's vehicles and money and stuff in people's opinions. So I'm sure the guys that drive around in them are had more fun, but it's okay. I just want to talk about our city's image. But the, the water park, the, the sprinkler thing is real important. It's dangerous. And uh, it's been going on a long time. Nobody keeps talking about it, but nobody does anything about it. I actually met with a guy about that. So he's, I was supposed to get him the, <clears throat> the diagram of the city and he's Got to, uh, he's gonna we're gonna put together maybe a bid for the thank city. you so that grip paper you know like they have yeah it's so I'm I'm not sure what, I haven't got through yet thank you I just want to bring but it. I don't know if, I don't know if Nate's got any pink paint in his <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate your comments thank I you. love Nate by the way he's a <laughs> great sheriff sure. is there anyone Good else way. who has comments tonight Nate we can start with pink shirts first I'm wearing those all at least one day a week <laughs> pink pistols maybe well I don't color shirts <laughs> So item number four, discussion possible action to approve special exemption to allow for reduction of the minimum requirements commercial landscape ordinance for the development located at 101 Mimosa Lane. Mr. Johnson. 
Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, Council. So, we're revisiting this thing. It was tabled at the last meeting. Uh, I think we discussed it quite a bit that uh, what was presented uh, before construction wasn't what uh, was actually constructed. And so, the property owner requested a special exception. Well, after the last meeting, um, he came back with this plan. It's not ideal from what we were looking for, but it meets the code. So you can see he's going to saw cut some of the asphalt, uh, remove the, the soil, the aggregate that's under the asphalt, and replace it with soil and put two trees in each planter box, which will meet the, the buffer requirement, the street frontage requirement, excuse me. Um, he said 30 days, um, he should have it all done. So. I'm sorry, just to clarify, the mm -hmm. planters, those are concrete planters? Or? So those are, they're actual curved planters. So they're so built into the ground. They're going to be built into, so be even with the curb. asphalt, and then you have okay. the six inch curb and then built in the soil. And, okay. Yeah. So it would be for someone who, someone would not intentionally to drive over, say, a curb planter thing. Yeah, I mean, it would be, uh, it would be a discouraged. <clears throat> um, but there's still, as you can see, there will be 29 feet in between each planter that somebody, if they so choose, could drive in between the planters and pull into a parking spot or pull out of a parking spot and onto Mimosa. I think Trey had mentioned at the last meeting the possibility of the concrete, I have no idea what you call them, but the little concrete things that stop you from going past the front of the parking space. Yeah. Um, Honestly, I think Mr. Wright is not here tonight. He is out of town. Okay. Um, this is out of batteries. Looks like. Um, and we didn't we didn't talk about the the planners when I met with him and he gave me this diagram for what he's proposing. Um, but he did mention that at the council meeting and I think uh, that's something that we can continue to encourage him to, to install or the parking bumpers. Would you recommend the parking bumpers in addition to the proposal? Well, I mean, or? I, if I'm wrong though, if we're not asking for a special exception, we're kind of done on it, right? Well, that's I don't have anything that I can make him there with the parking bumpers. So we kind of but I encourage him. Encourage him. Uh, to so. with oh, we can't take any action on what was presented. Now he's gonna. Apparently, that's the code. Is what he's, he's, he's okay. trying. His intent is to meet our code. But since we he's not asking for the special exception. So right, and I since we tabled it. Oh, since we I had to bring okay. it back to you. And okay. So we don't have to do anything at all. No, he said, I will do this to comply. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So we're in a good place as far as you're yep. concerned. Yeah. I mean, better than where we were. Like I said, it's not my ideal situation, but it, it meets the code. So. Okay. Sorry. Thank you for clarifying. Do you have a John? If you can look back at the previous slide, line, please. I can show you. Okay, I'd like to suggest, uh, I'm concerned about handicapped parking. The last one I saw only had one. That, that's not a part of this topic. Oh, okay. I, I understand your concern about handicapped parking, but the uh, item is the special exemption for the landscaping and not the parking piece of it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. Okay, item number five, discussion and possible action related to adoption of ordinance number 1290-2019, amending part 12, planning and zoning and development, chapter two, zoning general and district provisions of the code of ordinance of city Tahlequah, including but not limited to definitions and uses permitted in R1 single family dwelling district, R2 two family dwelling district, R3 multifamily dwelling district, can't even talk, C1, Neighborhood Commercial District, C2, General Commercial District, I1, Restricted Light Industrial District, and I2, Light Industrial District. Mr. Johnson. So, don't don't worry, Bree. What changed? Don't worry. You gave me 21 pages to read and you changed No, it. that was what's in the packet. Okay, the only thing that's different there are some of the um, proposed or suggested changes didn't get highlighted in the yellow. I don't know if they passed through on what you get in your packet. 
And so I went through and highlighted the best I could um, that needs to be looked at, thought about, and give us recommendations, give us some feedback. Um, we're just bringing ideas to you, Grant and I, um, but we really want your feedback and want to know what part of the zoning code that you want to tackle at this time. So I don't think, I, wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't recommend action on this item tonight. Thank you. Um, it is a, a second reading. We could act if you guys so choose, but I would never, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, I don't think we can. Yeah. I think our public hearing is actually next meeting. Isn't that right? Well, we had talked at the last meeting about wanting to have a public conversation, maybe at the armory or something. Okay. Never mind. I apologize. I might be thinking of another one. Yeah. But any of it, I agree with yeah. Mr. Johnson that today is just a discussion. Yes. Concept. Absolutely. It's not ready for a future. Because we probably need to also correlate this with the comprehensive plan, correct? Yeah. I mean, there are some recommendations that might relate to the comprehensive plan, but this is really just fixing an existing system that's broken. Um, it's it's cleaning up some definitions. It's adding some new ones. It's changing the zoning districts that some of the permitted uses sit in. So it, it's not, it, it's subtle changes. It's not a, a full rewrite of our zoning code. We're trying to work within what we already have established and know. And we're just trying to improve it because from 2005 or 2003 when we adopted it, a lot has changed. And so um, we need to change it to fit with the times, really, is all we're doing. I'm going to ask a question. I'm not sure if it's still related to this or not, so I'll let you stop me, Grant, if I, if I get off in left field. So the tiny homes mm -hmm. thing, as I understand it, that's not allowable now under our ordinance, correct? I guess it depends on how tiny you get. Okay. Um, so we do have something that would cover a tiny home in here. It's not in our zoning ordinance. That's going okay. to be in our building code. Okay. And your minimum square footage requirement. So that's not at all related to, to what we're talking about. No, okay. but I mean, no, it, it, it relates in a way that the way people use their accessory dwelling units. That's the okay. that's the professional <laughs> term for tiny homes. Okay. Um, you know, because we've talked about the Airbnb, the traditional B and B, the and that is included in here. Is to okay. look at some of those definitions and look at some of those districts on where you want to see those lie. Because the way it is right now, there's a lot of non-conforming uses out there. Okay. Okay, that was helpful. Thank you. A question. Uh, Clayton, hey, to the microphone, please. Nancy. What about you, uh, Nancy Dyson? Thank you. I want to ask Clayton a question. Sure. Uh, just to clarify, on these new uh, zoning rules mm -hmm. and definitions, would an Airbnb, would that be allowed in an R2 zoning? It depends on how we want to look at Airbnbs, because we have two different versions of Airbnbs. We have an Airbnb with a permanent, re a permanent resident, owner, somebody that lives there all the time and they rent some of their space or they rent their garage apartment out, or they leave for the weekend and rent the whole house, but there's a permanent resident there at that address. That's one form of Airbnb. Then there's another form of Airbnb where that is the sole purpose of that property is to be used as a temporary sleeping facility for rental. There's no permanent resident there. And so that's what they're going to have to decide is do they want to treat those separately? Do they want to lump them in as one and the same? And which district do they want to put it in? It has presented tonight, just so everybody's on the same page, a tourist home would meet the definition of an on-site resident Airbnb I, th I believe the way we have it defined or trying to define and a tourist court would be that off-premises and that tourist home is placed in R1 before you and the tourist <coughs> court is placed in R2 as drafted here which is a movement tourist court technically isn't it C1 right now or something or C3 or something? I, th I think it is in C it's in C yeah. but your traditional bed and breakfast is R3 Right. And the concept would be to, re to move bed and breakfast down to R2. Correct. Yes. And I am opposed to that uh, for a couple of reasons. And one reason is because that doesn't protect our existing neighborhoods. Um, and everybody that has a home, uh, 
understands that they don't want to leave your term with transients uh, going in and out of these uh, rentals, whether anyone's there or not. Uh, and another issue, uh, which I really think is more important than property values, and that's the children. Uh, one of these, uh, I'm going to call it a non-compliance, uh, I think you know where I'm talking about, is directly across the street from a public school. And I think there should be some verbiage in the city ordinance that prevents that from happening. I don't think that they should be allowed to operate right across the street from a public school because there's no way to prevent sexual predators from renting these places. Just so that I'm clear though, right, so everybody else here discussing is, is clear not to, to buck your position. I have a neutral position. Oh, you go ahead. You have before. But not, <laughs> or but tried. I'm, well, uh, again, I'm not putting any policy before you all. This is my own. This is just the council's. Are you suggesting the transient issue across the board? Because if that's the case, then the on-site premises Airbnb would be an issue in residential as well for you. Like if I was renting out a room of my home, you're saying that that wouldn't be appropriate because I might have somebody stay the night there, right? If it's uh, within so many feet of a public school, yes, I think that that would be inappropriate because there's no way to check. And now the Tulsa uh, County officials there have told me that they are having people check in their sex predators that uh, normally under the law have to register. And so whenever they check into Tulsa County, they're saying, hey, I'm homeless. And this is actually, this did come up in our previous discussion because then I asked you, what about hotels? Because uh -huh. right now there's not a qualifier for hotels having to be a distance from a school. And right, that's, that's what so I said that you've done this well before. Then? For a I just I think that it is uh, I think that it's not just an opportunity for the council but I feel like that you have a duty to try to protect our schools and our children you talk about wanting to do things for the children this is a prime opportunity for you to protect them from sexual predators that do rent these places it seems like I've had a conversation with somebody about this Nancy I don't remember it wasn't you I don't remember who it was but then I asked I asked that individual if that's I mean, is that a trend? Is that something that we see? Is there a history of, I mean, of sexual predators with Airbnbs that are? They might be able to comment. I mean, I don't know if that's is that a thing. Is that something no. we need to? We haven't say. researched it specifically. The issue we're seeing more right now are um, sex offenders staying in hotels for long lengths of time because they're considered transient, and so it's not their home, so they can't stay in a hotel by state standard like that. So. We haven't. I don't know of any specifically in town. I mean, that's well, not I'm saying I it's not I haven't possible. Seen, I mean, it's not. I haven't seen anything on the news stating you know Airbnb, uh, you know, pedophile on the on the loose. I mean, I don't know of any incidents in Tahlequah. Okay. So. Okay. So that's that's all. I'll, I'll dig into that and see if that's you know if that's something that's really. I don't a, think that you ought to wait until it happens. I think, uh, and that's why I use the word prevent. You have an opportunity to prevent something bad happening to a child from people going in and out of these Airbnbs that are right across the street from a school. Yeah, absolutely. Mr. Johnson, would you consider scheduling a public conversation so that those people who are interested in the Airbnb and in the machinery repairing and other items that are addressed in here can have an opportunity to speak other than I mean, in council if, if meeting? That's your wish, yeah. I mean, we can schedule a meeting. But that is what this is, is the public hearing for anybody to come and join this conversation. I think that we, if we let the residents know that there's several topics here, that we would have too many people speaking for a council meeting. I think our time frame would be short. So I'd really rather have that conversation elsewhere, gather those ideas and those thoughts, and then bring that forward. Well, I hardly ever try to bring up a problem and not try to give a solution. So I do have a, what I think is a fairly easy solution. is just to add verbiage into the city ordinance uh, that they not be allowed to operate with a square of so many feet of a public school or of a school. Uh, it would be easy to add that. That's already in other laws that uh, they're not to live within so many feet of a school. So Thank I you. think you could just add that and then allow them other places if that is what you all chose to do. But putting it across the street from a school, 
I just don't think that would be the right thing to do at all. And I don't think that we should wait until something happens and then say, oh, yeah, somebody brought that up once before. Uh, maybe we should have listened. I don't think that we ought to take that risk. I just don't think it's worth it. Thank you, Nancy. Other comments, counselors? Ms. Rogers. Joel and Rogers, um, if you have a public discussion, will you discuss all of the changes like the R1, the R2, will, or will it just be Airbnb? And um, my, my concern was that there were several different industries or uh, possibly businesses that are affected by these changes. Well, I mean, are you going to, dis if you have a public hearing, will you discuss all that you've listed here? Uh, my concern is R1, the current verbiage says that R1, um, five unrelated people can live in an R1 residence. And, I, and that has prompted a lot of the college kids can do that in a residential area. And you've got, you start with four or five and you end up with 10 or, and all the cars. And I wondered if that could be reduced. That's my concern. Any other comments? Hearing none, item number six, discussion of possible action to approve the updated Tahlequah Regional Airport <coughs> Policy Manual. Kelly Crimson. Kelly and I, uh, I reviewed this over the weekend and there's some changes to be made on it. So I brought Kelly to my office this afternoon and I think that uh, he'd probably ask for no action on that tonight and then bring it back when he scribbled a little bit more. Yeah, we have a few typos and a few things we'd like to clean up before we bring this to the full council approval. Okay. The only thing I noticed I'm going to ask about, and I'm assuming you probably caught this or know this, on page four, I guess at tab one, there's something that references no more than 40 we'll years. 25 issues. 25? Yeah. Okay, all right. That's the only thing I caught, and I tried to read it, but it was it was excruciatingly painful. But yeah, thank you for just putting it together. I would, I would ask, though. This was some harsh reading for the weekend. <laughs> If you all have any notes from your review, please give them to Kelly and, my, and or myself and we'll implement those with Tess Willer or some other people. Help. Then, item number seven, discussion of possible action to approve a private number 37 between Tom Farmer and the city of Tahlequah. Mr. Grittenham. I just uh, say that I would like the council to approve that. We've been back and forth over that for several, for about a month and a half now. And I'd like to get this done for uh, Mr. Farmer. He's been nothing but working with us. I'll make the motion to approve as read. I have a motion. Is there a second? I'll second. Just to clarify, Grant, was that, do we get that legally clear? Everything good on that? Yeah, I think so. It's in your packet. Okay. Well, I just wanted to make sure we cover. Okay. Thank you. Is, is there discussion? Hearing none, could we have a roll call, please? Councilor Ratliff? Yes. Councilor Long? Yes. Councilor Collins? Yes. Motion carried. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Item number eight, discussion possible action to approve a private hangar lease site number one between Randy Tigg and the city of Tahlequah and or an assignment transfer of private hangar lease site one from Scott Hansen to Randy Tigg. Same thing, we've been back and forth over this for about a month and a half. And these guys are getting very impatient with uh, how long this has taken. Um, oh, I'm sorry. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? I'll second. You don't need to clarify if you're just approving the lease. Okay, there's not a, uh, if we're looking at page 32, is that what we're looking at? 32 through 38, correct? Which one? I just, yes. not at eight. Okay, so the lease that we're approving, should there be an amount in there? So my understanding is, 
it w there was never a located uh, lease with Scott Henson, so there's a loose presented lease to Randy T here in front of you. And I would suggest you probably make it the same fee that you just approved the last one to keep them in conformity. Okay, so um, does, do they need to retract and modify their motion since we made a motion without the amount on here? They just they need to amend it to approve at least to Randy Teague, and then you go ahead and write in the amount the annual due on rental charges 150 on last one you just approved. So that's probably what you should put in. Is that the standard? Uh, yes. It's six foot square foot. See what I'm saying? What I'm what I'm getting at is you just approved it as submitted it had it gave you options because it wasn't clear if there was an assignment actually that would work and there isn't is what I'm telling you. That you have to approve a lease to Randy T as presented with one fifty written on the front page in that blank. That's what you're Do we also need to put an amount in the not shall not exceed blank per square foot during any five year period? That's not in the one you just approved before this one. It's not. So Okay. That's your choice. I think it gives you the option to come back later and, and, and give, you know, okay. change that term within five years. So you modified your motion to 150? Approving it with 150? That's the standard, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Have a motion and second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. Councilor Long? Yes. Councilor Combs? Yes. Councilor Ratliff? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you all. Thank you. Item number nine, discussion possible action to remove marijuana dispensaries from the current moratorium. Councilor Ratliff. You know, I got to thinking of, <clears throat> over the last week or so about our conversation, and I understand how, you know, the issues with the, with the grow house, houses, and how they're not zoned correctly, and then the issue with, you know, like uh, Ray had brought up with the processing and the process for which you know for which they're but I, I guess I missed why why dispensaries were on that list. Was I was I missing something as far as the and you know, why we get a moratorium for those dispensaries? As far as our zoning or ordinance or I mean, will they not be they will be C one, will they not be C one? That's that's up to you all I guess, but right now the best fit they are being operated as C1 today. Is that right, Mr. Johnson? That is what we advised them. So from the very beginning was C1 they were commercial? I have no issue with removing the marijuana dispensaries from that moratorium. Ray, you got anything? I, I think we're all in agreement with the, the dispensary. I think that that was uh, basically it was on there because we were doing the broad sweep of trying to get everything. Mm -hmm. but. The dispensary is already in its in its spot where it needs to be. I don't have a problem with it. Uh, Clint and I have discussed it. Uh, Grant and I have discussed it together. We, it's it's going to be where it is. So I don't have and, a and but pending some changes to you know these ordinances that we just went over, and some of that stuff will be cleared up. But you know, and I think like you talked about, some of it's pro, you know involves butane, and some of it involves you know. High capacity lights and watering, and so I don't think I don't think this is. And no, also, think this, this is, is basically like a retail store. Yeah, yeah. So, um, okay. Well, I'll make, I'll make a motion to, um, to remove the marijuana dispensaries from the moratorium. Is there a second? Second. Have a motion and a second. Is there further discussion? Hearing none. Councilor Cross. <laughs> yes. Councilor Ratliff. Yes. Councilor Long? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Item number 10, discussion possible action related to watering curbside gardens, the parklets on Main Street. Councilor Ratliff. I've had this sweet little lady named Sandy come by my office, and she is um, super sweet and has done fabulous things with the parklets, bump outs, um, what's the other term for them? Roadside gardens. Yeah. So you know, I think I think, and I've had I've had conversations with uh, Mrs. Hale about this, and with Charles as well, because I didn't want to you know, roll them under the bus. But I think we've got to figure out. You know, it's kind of tough when we put these when we put these 
conceptually that you know these um, parklets are a great idea and they're you know they're beautiful and they do fantastic things for you know just for the aesthetic appeal of, of downtown Tahlequah and I you know I'm a fan regardless of which way the benches face or whatever but I think um, is what's been hasn't really been communicated is you've got the, the contract, Jamie, do you want to come up? Sure. I mean, the contract, as far as the as far as the city is concerned, is to maintain, right? Is that what it says? Correct. To maintain. Yep. But I think the, you know, when we the city decided to put them in, you know, the planting as your packet read, your pa you know, is uh, they initially kind of planted on themselves, and then Main Street picked them up, but then Main Street kind of planted them, and then Main Street kind of subbed them out to the business owners, and then some of the business owners. You know, did a good job taking care of them, and others did not. And then, you know, then they started to die. And then now, uh, Sandy and her crew have have kind of picked up the slack, and they look great. But then becomes this watering issue: is how do we? Because Main Street isn't really necessarily equipped to water them. Sandy and her crew have got like a 50-gallon drum and the water, and you know, I don't know if that's safe for us to have them, you know, out there watering and. Um, so I just I just question and I'll bring this to you know to this council is what's what's the what's the answer I mean how can we find an answer like a long term solution to this so we don't just keep kicking it around between Main Street and the city and Sandy's crew and anybody have any suggestions should this be part of the park I mean should park be watering this or should I mean I sent Jamie a picture of basically a 300 gallon pull behind trailer with an automatic, you know, gas-powered pump, so that, you know you could fill it up and potentially water. But you know, Jamie doesn't necessarily have the capacity. You know, somebody to do it, something to pull it with, uh, you know, um, to a, store a place to store it so it doesn't disappear. Have you checked with Charles to determine whether we have a watering device of some sort? I think they do have. I mean, they do have. They use it for multiple purposes, but. Um, I think the question really as far as Charles, you know, with Charles was just kind of, you know, to my understanding what Sandy says is it takes three hours, okay, mm -hmm. she thinks it should be done every day, which I don't know, you know, depending on the weather, I think, you know, as often as possible is good, but I don't know, Charles seems to think that it's, um, it's, it's time, right, so, it and, and also, another difficult thing, you know, the way that I see it is if, if this um, tank is stored at Anthus Brennan, right, and now you have to hook it up to a tractor or to a truck, and then you have to fill it, and then you have to haul it downtown, and then you have to water, and then you have to haul it back out, and then you have to, do, you know, it takes just as long to get downtown as, you know. So, um, it, it is probably a person a half a day, mm -hmm. pretty much, yeah. and, and it's not, gee, we can water all but the weekends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When I went to work at the chamber in 2015, and I worked with Drew, I mean, Drew would get up every morning and he would go water mm -hmm. every morning early before he came to work. Mm -hmm. And I don't recall, I mean, Drew, how long did it take you when you did it? It takes three hours to water. It took three hours? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And you got to do it early or you get the traffic. If you don't get there before the traffic does. Right, because you can't find parking. You're in, yeah, it gets crazy. You can't get to them. So I don't know, what Jamie, what's your thoughts on... I mean, I think it's maintain, you know, and is that, a, is that a loose term? I mean, does that include, you know, daily watering or? Um, honestly, with container gardens, you pretty much have to water daily yeah. unless you get a good rain. Right. And that's, and that's not, I mean, that's, I understand the watering, you know, when it's hot and when it's dry and so on and so forth. But I guess my question would be, with our contract with Main Street, does... You know, does does maintain is that does that place that responsibility of watering on them, and you know, and I feel like we have some responsibility since there's not really spigots anywhere close to a lot of those. There's not. You know, most and, of or, the business owners that yeah, do, they'll so I mean, drag not, out buckets. Or um, I emailed each individual sponsor that we have. I think there's 23 bump outs altogether, and um, not one of them really have access to an outside source. So they're filling them up in the little bathrooms on the inside and, you know, shuffling them out if they need to be. Um, I don't have an answer. Um, and, you know, I'm, but I would love for us to work together to kind of come up with something that is feasible, um, you know. I mean, I think the, you know, 
I think we have, the city has the equipment. And my the question whether or not, you know, Charles isn't here, whether or not we have the manpower. You know, but um, I'd like to see, you know, I'd like to see some cooperation with Main Street. You know, I mean, clearly we don't want them to die. You know, I don't think that helps, I don't think that helps anybody. So what are your guys' thoughts on putting it on part to water? Seems I like think we should wait till probably Charles is here to join us in that discussion because I hate to make departmental decisions without him here. Because obviously Charles has got significant historical knowledge on everything that is Tahlequah. Yeah, and I, I told him about it. I don't know. I'm surprised he's not here, but um, you know, his words to me was they didn't have the manpower to do it. You know? And so, and also that the the contract with the city was for them to maintain. So I think that's where there's some miscommunication. And that's probably where we can go back and clean up a lot of our leases we have and better define those terms like in your typical contracts, define what maintain it is so you don't have this issue of confusion. How long has the agreement been in place with Main Street? I think it's been probably three years, three, three four years. At least three since 2015 years. because I think we bumped up, did we bump up the amount of the contract? Yeah, they changed it. <laughs> <laughs> you should, but no. You say that again, Drew? You didn't, but you should. I thought at one point we, we there was a bump. Well, it went from five thousand to twenty five thousand, but that was like six years ago. Okay. So Diane, we Yeah, yeah I, I just have a quick comment, Diane Weston, sorry. Um, I'm just wondering, are there requirements or what types of plants can be planted? I mean, it would make sense to have low water use plants. There is a list attached to our um, agreement that we send out to um, the adoptees um, that gives a list of plants that was given by the Garden Club. I believe, if I'm not mistaken, um, but yes, ideally it would be nice if it was I know. Well, so to Diana, I think currently the way that it's set up is the the Garden Club has has got sponsorship from a lot of the nurseries, and so you've got the Sunshine and the Greenleaf and the Park Hill, and and I think a lot of it really is just whatever plants they they donate. You know, yeah, so I mean, I don't know that there's saying, a specific yeah. list of zinnias yeah. or. And then Main yeah. Street also gives uh, the Garden Club has come to at us a couple of times and. Yeah, we give them money to buy bunches. Um, what about a rainwater container of some kind? Right. With yeah. an automated timer, you then you're three hours a week. You fill them up once a week. And do you think that there I, are, Jamie talked about that? Did, or that mm -hmm. would that be like inside the plant? It's like a self. Yeah. Like so it essentially there. waters them from. I mean, just looking on Google right now, you could probably yeah. do it for about a hundred dollars a. That's just looking so on you're Google. Talking about basically a fancy rain barrel. It's hidden. Yeah, there. it would look like a clay pot. You didn't. Have, you don't have to get the big ones. You could get a smaller one that looks like a clay pot with a twenty-five dollar timer on it. Mm -hmm. And while the upfront cost might be a lot, the right. man hours alone it would save. Mm -hmm. You're talking about saving twelve man hours a week. And I spoke with Durant Main Street has the same, this very same thing, and um, they do the self-watering pots. And she did say they um, fill them up about once a month. In order to so that's it, but it's a high cost. Could that you know, qualify can, for your big idea? It could. <laughs> you gonna do it? Trying to fill a semi. semi <laughs> that, you know. that could be great. You know, and so I mean, I think because I think the that's your man hours and the city's man hours. If we can, you mm -hmm. know, if we can move those aside and not have to worry about about just the hours, and you got you know, I think that makes the most sense. But mm -hmm. I don't know. I haven't done the research that Nate has to, and I think I you just said that Nate, back here on my phone. Yeah. 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 Well, I, well, I'd look crazy yeah. if I was doing that. And, well, and I've seen the very large ones that they have the six, seven hundred dollars a pot. So um, maybe let's maybe let's try that. And if and if the, uh, the big idea doesn't like it, there's still that Tahlequah Community Fund grant is available mm -hmm. right now too. So mm -hmm. maybe you guys could apply for that. Yeah, some of those. And the only other thing I would add is just that the types of plants. I, I was actually in Arizona this summer, and it was 100. It was 110 there too. They have beautiful planters everywhere, but they have low water plants. And I'm guessing they don't water them every day when it's 110 degrees in Arizona. But anyway, I, some options. I, Are I you not on the garden stay. club? Pardon me. You not on the garden club? No. I figured you would be on there. <laughs> you think I would be? I worked too much. Did you add that? <laughs> <laughs> Great.
Thank you, too. Thank you. Okay. Any action desired? No? Then item number 11, discussion possible action to purchase a waste hauler trailer in Solid Waste Department. Mr. Armstrong. Okay. Well, hello. Um, before Ariel's packet, there's three different trailers. Um, it's pretty simple. It's pushing trash out and loading it back in. Um, Stetco is the trailers we've used over... Uh, I'd say probably 2004. Uh, right now we're at the point where we have four semis uh, and we only have three trailers. Uh, one trailer we uh, have to do regular maintenance on. So with this trailer added from Stepco, um, anything that happens uh, will be ready for it. We'll say uh, there's never be trash on the floor at all. So and this is a budgeted item. Uh, as long as this isn't on state contract, but you there's no taxes. You read my mind, Chris. You read my mind. There's no taxes. I was about to go there. Thank you. <laughs> but you said there's no taxes? Right. Um, the reason I go with Stetco is just to keep the fleet uh, uniform. Um, call one place to get all the Call one place to get the hoses and things like that. So, but just pushing it out and still in the scope. What's a uh, time frame on this? I mean, are you uh, are you limp? Are you limping back and forth? Or? No, like right now we have a steady handle on it. Um, our our trap or our refuse volume has went down since they opened up the bridge again. So we're not collecting it. Like it's not the city of Wagner, but it's a, a private uh, hauler that comes and brings it in Fort Gibson. We're not taking theirs because they can go over the bridge and go to the landfill. So our volume has went down. So we're fine. And then so. on the Stecco steel trailer quote tray, it says delivery date 24 to 26 weeks. Is that your question? Right. I mean, I saw this. You know, we still got time there. I didn't know. Are you wanting to? Well, um, this uh, like they build these from the ground up. This isn't just something that's sitting so on the lot. It's an order, order yeah. deal, special order deal. And, and everything else that's pre-made is aluminum based. Uh, aluminum is getting stronger, but this kind of stuff that we haul is just going to pop the bottoms out, and we're going to start all over. So, like, in my opinion, right now, where the city's at is the steel ejector trailers and eventually moving along to walking floors when we uh, build up to that. What do you call it? The walking floors. Uh, the steel ejector is just a big blade in front and it pushes the trash out. The walking floors move like this and push the trash out, um, which reduces hydraulic. Um, Hydraulic or hydraulic fluid, so you can carry more load. So, in the like in the, I guess the long term, once we go that way, we'll reduce uh, fuel costs and things like that. But as of right now, like all my trucks are set up for steel ejector trailers. So when when would we? I mean, if it's not if it's still what is that three four months out? Right? Mm -hmm. Six. When would pay for it? Pay for it now. No, we pay we pay ten percent right now, and then whenever it's built, we pay the rest of it. So that's whenever we get it, or whenever it's yeah, like whenever they deliver it, that's when we'll cut the net PO. Well, actually, you cut the PO when you place the order. Well, yeah, but but I wouldn't re like release that uh, PO number yet. You see what I mean? So. My, my my only question is whether or not you know do we need to get started on it to tell them to start building it or it is a budgeted item correct Chris yes ma'am but you're currently functioning okay without it right right, okay. right. would there be other things in your department that would be more pressing for you to have instead of this if you don't necessarily need it I mean I hate to spend seventy thousand dollars if we don't need it right um like right now like we're fine. Um, I just, I'm just trying to keep it again, uh, taking in construction debris and stuff takes up a lot of airspace. Um, the only thing that I can really see us using this money for would be, uh, would be dumpsters because we're having more businesses come in. We're having, was it, was it Roush being built behind Lowe's? 
they're going to want to dumpster and things like, like things like that. But if I don't have a trailer, I can't haul it if something happens. That's a catch-22, isn't it? Yeah. Say, say again, you're saying you can't haul the, the roll-offs without the, is that what you're talking about? No, no, uh, no, the trash in general. Like, uh -huh. say if, uh, say my hydraulic tank breaks on my trailer, then we only have two, we only have two trailers to run. You see what I mean? So you got three, you got three of these trailers now? Yes. But one of them's like on its last leg, like this thing was built in like the 40s. So, yeah. That was a good decade, Chris. It might have been, but not in the trash home business. <laughs> <laughs> so, but man, that would, I mean, I guess that would be concerned about that too, is if, you know, if that one goes down, then you're down to two, mm -hmm. right? And then this would be the third one that's kind of in line and still six months out, right? Right. So what are we talking about? Six months be spring? Yes. This one's ten thousand dollars cheaper than the others, right? Right. No, it's just three thousand. Well, this Looking is at the discounted price. Yeah. So yeah, that's not ten thousand. Yeah. So Oh yeah, one seventy four seven. One seventy two. your opinion on whether or not we should you know trash service is pretty critical to our residents and like another thing is if we have this trailer we'll never turn anybody away again like the whole shutting the gates whenever uh, we had those rollovers in the past uh, we turn people away all the time county city all that with these or with this trailer we won't like those gates will never get shut except at four o'clock when we go home for the day and that will increase the revenues for your department, correct? Potentially, By yes. not having to ever shut, that was a double negative. Um, <laughs> keeping the gates open will keep the revenues up. Yeah. Okay. We'll keep it going, yes. Okay. Is there a motion? I'll make the motion to approve. Thank you, Dan. The purchase of the Stecco. Uh, Stecco. Sixty-two thousand. Is that right? Sixty-nine three thirty. Sixty-nine three thirty. I will second that motion. <laughs> okay. Motion is second. Is there further discussion? That's after the discussion. Or that the deposit. If there's no further discussion, Councilor Ratliff. Yes. Council Long. Yes. Council Jones. Yes. Motion carried. Item number 12, discussion of possible action to purchase a Hyper-V network server and storage appliance device for the city of Tahlequah. And I don't know if that's Hyper-V or Hyper-5. So Hyper-V. I stumbled there. Hello, council members, Mayor. Uh, everyone should have a talk report that typed up, which should be a package, showing some of the pros of obtaining this. What we have, we have a lot of old servers in the city. They do a lot of work, keeps our, our employees employed. Uh, get doing busy work. Uh, when they fail, we lose several days sometimes of productivity in the city. We've got some that are getting ready to retire. Their, their hardware is end of life. The software is from 2008. They have to retire by the uh, beginning of the year. And what this is, is uh, we have a replacement server and a storage appliance that work together. And what it is, is a uh, uh, this is a budgeted item. This was planned for, and it is currently budgeted under the fund site uh, 110 51 86 20, which involves replacement of network servers. And money is present. I'll just ask for permission to spend that money. Randy, I have a question. Yes. So you're requesting to buy the 23729 or the 151792? They are both. Together. It's, it's, it's two serves. They work together. You can't buy one. You have okay. to get both. And is this a state contract item? Yes. It's Dell. We have a state a state contract under Dell. Okay. That's where you purchase all of our servers from. Okay. And years. 
Gotcha. Is that state contract number on here? Because I somehow missed that when I looked at this yesterday. No, I, I can obtain it. Okay. okay, gotcha. But these are items off a of state contract because I noticed when I looked at this yesterday that there was only the information from Dell and no other competing companies. Yes. So that's why I got confused. For the most part, all of our network equipment, all of our computers are currently uh, Dell. And the reason is we're, we're properly educated on them. We don't know how to <coughs> operate, how to maintain them. And in the past, this has been discussed before about why do we go to another company. And have we looked at all the refurbished items? We've, we've touched on the refurbished items before, and I was blatantly told it's not going to happen. Refer to refurbished items. <coughs> and the last three years, it's always been told we do not buy used equipment. Just to, uh, I'm sorry, just far as I'm sorry, who told you that, sir? A previous mayor. Uh, he said we don't buy, do not buy refurbished server equipment, that we will only buy new. Uh, the equipment we have right now is is old. It was bought in the 2013-2014 period. You know, even the software is from 2008. And effective in January of uh, 2020, uh, the, ser the server software is end of life, which means there's no more support, no patches, it becomes a security risk at that point. The hardware is no longer maintainable. It's hard to get parts. And uh, they're, they're real expensive. They're but, but these are for the hardware only. This doesn't have anything to do with the software, correct? These servers come with the software. Is including okay. the software. The software alone for this is approximately six thousand dollars. What this does is, uh, every time we need a new server, we have to buy one server, approximately fifteen thousand dollars for each server. And what this box here does, it's a virtual server, which means we can add virtual servers on this one box. We can add five, six, seven, eight, nine. So over time, the city will recoup some savings because instead of buying a hardware device, every time you need a server for $15,000, this here, uh, you, it's basically adding a server on a hardware server platform. And we can keep stacking them up as long as you have memory and the hard drives to support them. We can keep uh, saving the city a lot more money over the years. So this would be the last server we should buy in some time. But the last one only lasted five years? Ser servers, according to Dell, most servers last approximately five years. You can't get extended warranties to bring them out in seven years. And after seven years, you, just, you have a hard time finding the parts. If a part dies, then you have to go out there on eBay or some part shop and try to find a, a spare part for it. So best case scenario, the $38,000 that we spend potentially tonight will last us five years? That's what last us for. I'll say it may be pushing close to seven years on the average. Does this quote you gave us include the extended warranty that you just referenced? <coughs> yes. Okay. It does include, so we'll get seven years with the extended warranty? Uh, original, uh, Dell usually includes a, a three-year warranty after that, and they, 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 at that point, you have to pay uh, subsidized rate. I can get the number for you if you want. But usually it comes comes meeting with a three year full warranty. And over the years as equipment becomes older, it becomes cheaper and cheaper to maintain. But uh, I had a similar incident uh, last year where I had to ask for a, a replacement to a cell server and it was turned down on the budget last year. Two months later it died. Okay, it crashed, could not fix it, and uh, we had to do some scrambling to come up with the money to do that. And meanwhile, the city was down to a cell server, a uh, lot of offices stopped real quick. So I want to caution against, uh, against that. It's something that needs to be done. It was planned, it's just been planned and scheduled. And if we approve it, how long until we get it? Uh, we already have the price quote. The way Dell is right now, it's taken about, uh, about two months to deliver. Because each one of these is a custom order. You know, they, they go back to the factory, they put it together, it's all custom order. They don't have nothing just sitting on the shelves. So, is there any problem that these quotes are expired? Uh, they, these quotes here, generally, they're, they, I have to get them refreshed. And I talked to my representative, Shruti. She's assured me that there should be no price increase. I last had these refreshed about a month ago. Uh, I tried to have it, I tried to have this up the last month. It was refreshed about 30 days ago. Originally, I got the price quote back in uh, uh, February time frame, and then about a month ago, I got it refreshed. 
on a price quote. Yeah, because this does show that this quote expired on July 24th, 2019. I, I can get that refreshed tomorrow. Okay. But if we take action tonight and we approve it in the amount of 38747 then, then I come back if, tomorrow. If I, can, if say, I can talk to my representative. If there's a price increase, then I have to know If anything, it should go down. Technology is always increasing value, right? Yeah. That's true. So, but if there is a price, price increase, I'll come back and I'll ask for additional grain increase. How about you tell her we approved you for 32 and then you get it reduced? <laughs> yeah. I like that idea. Yeah, it's possible. I mean, I, I ordered some really computers for the city. Well, I was two. quoted for $1,000 for a computer. And by the time I buy them, they're down to $795. And I've been able to save the city some money on computer purchases over the last six, seven months. I'm just asking that this has already been planned, it's already been budgeted, where I'm not asking for any additional money that's not already there. So let me ask, would a delay of a few months be a problem? No, it wouldn't be a problem. I think as long as it's done before, uh, as long as we get the equipment prior to January, the reason being is the software on these servers are trying to tire, it's end of life as of January 17, 2020. Uh, the software is no longer supported. There's no software patches. There's no fixes. And uh, it, in IT world, it becomes a security risk. So it's this new, new virus system every day. They're not protected. It becomes a security risk to the city. I'm just thinking that it might, if we delayed in another month or so, to we could be sure that our revenue is coming in the way that we intended it to and that our budget's good and stable by that point. Okay, I can, I can come back. I think that's a good idea since we don't absolutely have time today. We table it as it go to the next meeting? Yes. Unless you specifically table it to a certain meeting, like whatever months for the meeting. And I come back, I come back with a refresh quote. Good. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. No action. Discussion possible action to hire an individual and or firm to conduct a forensic audit and or review and analyze the of Telecom financial records. And I would like to go ahead and discuss items 13, 14, and 15 together. 14 being discussion possible action to hire an individual or firm to assist with the compilation of financial records in preparation for the audit and uh, 15 being the discussion possible action to hire an individual or firm to conduct an audit for fiscal year 2018-19. Is anyone opposed to combining the three in the discussion? Let's do it. Okay. So I gave each of you a summary document. And you'll have to bear with me just a moment as I find my copy. So, this is, this, is it, right? this is it, yes. Did you find it, Trey? Okay. So, the top part of this document is the compilation uh, proposals that we've gotten. We got four in from Arledge and Associates, Crawford and Associates, Barry Spires, and Hood and Associates. Um, three of the four gave us hourly rates, so I have those listed. But the notes below, Hood and Associates proposed a payment per hour agreement but didn't provide any hourly rates, but their estimated total for the compilation is 50000 Arledge and Associates proposed an all-inclusive rate of $33,000, which includes $13,050 for drafting the financial statements and $19,950 for the audit. Crawford's and Associates proposed a payment per hour agreement, which includes preparation of financial statements, including the notes of the statements, required supplementary information, other supplementary information that management may elect to include. 
and Barry Spires proposed a payment per hour agreement which includes preparing the financial statements, assisting in preparing and maintaining the depreciation and work in progress schedules, assist in preparing the schedule of state and federal assistance, assist in preparing management discussion and analysis, assist in making journal entries to reconcile the sub-ledgers to the general ledger, and any necessary correcting or closing entries. We have two firms who have submitted uh, audit service proposals. One is Arledge and Associates, which again, this is a duplication of what was said above, about the 33,000, including some audit work at 19,950. And then this evening, as we got here, we have one from Hood and Associates for the audit which does have hourly rates and a uh, fee proposal of 29,500 for the or for the audit and uh, three years of pricing on that. We also have a need for someone to either do a forensic audit or to review and analyze our financial records. Uh, forensic audit is available through the state auditor's office. We pay for that on a per hour cost reimbursement basis. Um, the estimate for that would be somewhere between 80000 and 100000 um, Both Crawford and Arledge would be willing to provide the review and analysis at their hourly rates, which are listed above. And uh, just in addition, the previous finance director, Marcy Gillum, is currently working for another city, but she is available to do some of the schedule development reporting and other support to the city of Tahlequah during their <coughs> off time at $40 an hour. So Arledge and Associates, their audit team is at $145 an hour. For Crawford and Associates, it's $125 for a manager and $110 for um, Barry Spires is $125 an hour. The, we do not want a single firm to do all three of the functions. So I talked to Arledge about that and they would prefer to do the <coughs> review and analysis and the audit and allow another entity to do the compilation. So what that would do would be give Whoever does, if Arledge did the audit, they would have already looked at some depth at the transactions during their review. So the review functions will reduce the number of hours for the audit to some degree. If we also <coughs> include Marcy in the equation, then that can reduce the number of hours at 110 to 145 dollars an hour. So what my recommendation would be would be to contract with Arledge and Associates for the record review and audit, contract with Crawford for the compilation, and then contract for Marcy Gillum for the support services to try to keep those hourly rates and the number of hours as low as possible. Say that again, Mayor. <laughs> Arledge. Arledge and Associates for the review and analysis and for the audit. And that's going to be that 33000 right? Well, actually, the they don't have a number okay. of hours for that review because until they get into it, there's no telling how many hours, how many hours that's going to take. Okay. So the audit we know would be 19950 
which is about 10,000 less than the amount proposed by Hood. And then the compilation from Crawford is? The compilation from Crawford, um, their estimate was, I'd have to go back to it, 50 something, let me flip the pages real quick here. Maybe 57,000 range from 57 yes. to 67. They give us a range. They do because it's dependent on how much support you've got in house. Right, and what they find. And yes. Okay. How much support do we have in house? Well, that's why I was recommending that we Marcy. contract with Marcy for the party <coughs> per hour. Not that our staff who's here aren't able to help to some extent. Um, Michelle Cook, in particular, has been here for three years, but the other two accounting staff, one's only been here for a month or two. Okay. Brianna, we just hired okay. a couple of months ago. And then uh, the other one has been here for a long time, about a year, Jerrica. So they, I don't think, have been through the audit process. Lanny? Two, two accountants sitting up here. Well, I think getting as many people involved as possible is a plus. And a, a lot of different eyes looking at from a different perspective. Uh, I think that's, that's a plus. So does that mean you're in support of the mayor's recommendations? Yes. Okay. I agree. I think it'll finally give us maybe a firm foundation and we can go forward. Do we need to, in the motion grant, do we need to include the, any of the particulars as far as the cost or the RC or uh, are we do, do we, can I just say, you know, Arledge for the review and the audit and Crawford for the compilation? You can do it generally, but you also, I mean, there you well, go. We've, we've got three different items, I mean, which I don't know how to. Right, I would I would take them as, as they come and directly vote for each to make it cleaner, maybe. Um, okay, and so. They have, been the, pulled, they have been pulled together, so it's, you know, you can vote them all at once okay, if you choose to. It's just if one is not approved that way, then you're going to have it all fall, if you know what I'm saying. So. Okay, with that said, uh, Forensic audit was not mentioned, right? Well, forensic audit is the review and was the well, forensic audit would be having the state auditors, inspectors' office come that was in. The 80 to 100. 80 to 100. And did have a recommendation from someone else today that the OSBI might be able to do something as well, and I didn't contact them. But. But we all know that Crawford's extremely reputable and or extremely reputable, and also is our ledge. So, I mean. Also, to clarify, are these all just for one year rate? These aren't a three year or anything, right? Like we're not. These are not only guaranteed if we do three years with the groups. Correct. And then with Marcy, it's just yeah. as needed. Some some of them have given three year rates. So. We're taking it one year at a time. That, that's what I'm just trying to clarify. Yeah. For this one, it is. Yes. John, would you like to speak? Well, um, now I'm rather late on this, but I just visited with someone that has the expertise that I have, and I don't know if they submitted it to you or not. Uh, his name is Christopher Law, okay, and he's the only one of the people listed there that's certified in financial forensics. Now you do have the other firms, but do you not have a staff member that is certified in that particular skill set? They are auditors, and I agree, they do peer review and stuff. But again, if you're looking for a higher level of awareness level and looking at documents and examine them with courtroom experience, this is the individual I would recommend. You, if you have any questions, I'll be glad to field those. Thank you, John.
Mayor, did they give us any type of a time frame on when this would be completed? If Arledge is selected to do the review, they would be able to begin next week. That's wonderful. If Crawford were to do the review and the compilation, it would be about three weeks out before they'd start that. Either review and analysis before they start the compilation work okay. so that they would be confident of what they're looking at okay. when they start pulling those reports together. So it really is do the review and get a report back on it and then move into the compilation which then leads to the audit. The three-step process. Okay. And so is this the audit that we're historically as a city behind on? Yes. I mean, in the, at what stage in the, in the past have you guys selected an auditor? Is it usually in August or September or October, or is it usually, you guys know? I honestly don't remember off the top of my head. I know we're always delayed every year. Mm -hmm. Might but is that, is, that, is that because of, well, they, they tried to select one before the fiscal year was over, but um, it always dragged out. And so my, my understanding is it drags out because once we get into tax season, the audits well, take the it, back seat. If it gets dragged out after the first year, yeah, you're in the tax season. And it, it's hard for the auditor to, to put his full support behind it. So if we can do it now, we can get it done before it. the end of the year. And it's supposed to be done before, before the end of the year. We'll actually be on time. And both Arledge and Crawford are aware of that state mandated deadline and would do everything possible to get us there. It's just that if the review delays us very so, long. And so what's, I mean, estimated, I mean, estimated ballpark, what are we, I mean, what are we talking about? I mean, we have an obligation to be audited for, you know, annually anyways, right? So that Correct. cost is coming regardless. And then compilation has to take place however that's because that puts the you know the information to be reviewed and then <coughs> so I mean what are we looking at as far as total I mean as far as total cost well we Ball, don't ballpark I mean hours and I mean you know if you had to guess if you had to guess 150 100 180 as far as number of hours no I mean how much it's worth total total cost for all three items The too soon to say. Kind of like rehabbing a house, you don't know until you start knocking out walls <laughs> to see what's, what's behind the wall. The audit is just under 20000 The compilation is probably somewhere in the fifty to 60000 And I'm going to say the review is probably going to be somewhere in 20000 They could be substantially less than that. It could be more than that, depending on what is found. So do we want to vote on these separately as three items? Is that what you recommended, Grant? Even I'm, though I'm we're just discussing them collectively. You, you can vote on them all together as well. I'm just saying if you do vote as a group and one person doesn't like one of those Okay. Might be an issue. Okay. Well, it sounds like both um, the treasurer and the mayor, who are both the only CPA sitting at this circle, are in agreement. So I think we would be foolish to disagree with the two CPAs in the room, as well as to disagree with your legal advisor. <laughs> <laughs> so with with that breeze, what I'm seeing is um, no action on 14, and uh, I'm sorry, no action on 13, and then 14. I can make I can make a motion to well 13 is where you get your review and analyze part that Mayor and Lane are suggesting from Allridge Ar 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 or Arledge Ar thank you and that's not 15 15 is so I mean 13 Arledge 14 Crawford 15 Arledge is that correct uh, we need 13 and 14 done before we do 15 that's fine. Yeah. Can we so clarify so one at a time so that I can get my minutes correct? Um, so we start with 13 I'm and we'll go down the list on how it needs to be done. 
Okay, item 13, discussion and possible action to hire a firm or firms to conduct a forensic audit and or review analyze City of Tahlequah financial records. That recommendation was Arledge. So, are you gonna do it, Trey, or get me to do it? You mess it up. You I'm gonna mess it up first, and then you can do this. Okay, I will make a motion that we hire Arledge and Associates. Do, and that's the hourly rate for the review part, correct? So we don't need to vote on the maximum amount since we don't know how many hours. <coughs> Could we add Marcy in that as well at the $40 an hour? Yes, I will happily modify my motion to include uh, contract services with Marcy Gillum in the amount of $40 per hour. Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there discussion? Go back over here. Yeah. Let's go okay. for it. Councilor Combs? Yes. Councilor Ratliff? Yes. Councilor Long? Yes. Motion carried. Okay. Item number 14 is the hiring of a firm to assist with the compilation of the financial records. That recommendation was Crawford and Associates. I'll make a motion to contract with Crawford and Associates to do our compilation on it. Is there a second? I'm sorry, just to clarify. I think, compilation. Yeah, it's just compilation, not compilation audit. Sorry. Compilation. Are you okay with that modification, Dan? Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there further discussion? If Councilor no? Ratliff? Yes. Councilor Long? Yes. Councilor Combs? Yes. Motion carried. And item number 15 is the hiring of an individual or firm to conduct an audit for fiscal year 18-19. I make a motion that we hire Arlington Associates to do the audit in the, in the amount of nineteen thousand nine fifty. Is that correct? That's that correct. Okay. There is a motion and a second. Is there discussion? Oh. I, I only have one question. Uh, if you have any profit and associates. Uh, you might try to verify whether they're on the approved list of auditors for state and local governments. Because I believe they do a lot of financial consulting, but they have to be on the approved list on an annual basis. So I would suggest that you review that, that they are on the list prior to making a vote. Crawford and Associates is doing the compilation. Which one? This is all. Uh, this is all. all our, our, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes. All. Arlington. Okay, thank you. Sorry. I have to look at it. Yes. Councilor Ratliff? Yes. Councilor Long? Yes. Councilor Charles? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you very much. And item number 16 is adjournment. Motion. Thanks. Councilor Long? Yes. Councilor Charles? Yes. Councilor Ratliff? Yes. Motion carried. Thank you very much.